Have you guys been enjoying the mystery series? Were you blown away by last week's the certification mystery? Yes. Hey? God is absolutely wonderful, hey? And he keeps on blowing our minds every single day, isn't it? Well, I hope if you spend time with him, he will. And uh, this is the 19th in the mystery series. And um, for those of you that have missed the previous ones, you can catch him up on YouTube. I've... I've just put on, what did I put on now, the certification mystery that was last week's one. And um, I want to read the scripture, I just felt to put this in today. John, um, Jeremiah 33 verse 3, it says, He called to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. You do not get these mysteries just willy-nilly, I promise you. Go and try and look on YouTube with what I'm sharing today, you will not find it. Okay, good luck to you. Okay. The, you get these from searching the heart of God and saying, God, reveal things to me. Okay? And I pray that you'll be, uh, no, I know you'll be richly blessed. You're going to have to put on your concentration cap, okay, as we try and join all the dots. You know, when you, when little kids draw one, two, three, four, that's what we're going to do. So that we can understand what God is trying to actually desperately desires for his church to understand. And that's why we're doing the mystery series. This morning I'm sharing on the Pidjana Ben mystery. Who knows what that is? Anyone? No one? Don't worry, you will after today. Here we go. Would you read with me Numbers 3 verse 44 through to 48? And it reads as follows. The Lord also said to Moses, Take the Levites in place of all the firstborn of Israel and the livestock of the Levites in place of their livestock. The, Le 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 the Levites are to be mine. I am the Lord. To redeem the 273 firstborn Israelites who exceed the number of the Levites, collect five shekels for each one according to the sanctuary shekel which weighs 20 Ganeras. Give the money for the redemption of the additional Israelites to Aaron and his sons. That is what you call the Pidjan Aben. And basically, what that means is, and I put it on the next screen, it means ransom. You are paying a ransom for your son, to redeem your son. And what would happen is um, the firstborn son of every, every couple belong to the Lord. Okay? If you wanted your son back, the priest would say, so do you rather want five shekels of silver or do you want your son? What would you say? I want my son. And you would give him the five shekels. Got it? And that shekel, five shekels would be his, and the child would be yours as the parent. Why was this done? Why did God do it? He has part of the mystery. God, God did this, and part of the reason, and you'll see it, it works on not just with regards to the first fruit of the womb, it regards, it's with regards to the first fruit of everything that you have. Hello? If you, if you get an increase in your salary, you should take that and give it to your priest. That's actually the way God has ordained things. Who has ever done that here? Hey? <coughs> but in any case, we're not going to get into that. Maybe some of you think I want your money. I don't want that. I want, you, I want to see you in heaven one day. But this is what would take place. So the first fruit of everything belonged to the Lord. And he did this so that you would never ever... Allow that to have a hold over you and over your heart. Not your money, not your jewelry, not your property, not your what's dear to you. He, he wanted us to understand that he at the end owns everything. And it's in a sense saying, Lord, I acknowledge that everything belongs to you. So what would happen is on the 31st day, the father would take his son 
And then the priest would say, which would you rather have? And he'd say, I'd rather have my son. And he'd give him the five shekels. Okay? If the father did not do that, when the son came of age, in other words, when he was 13, he could do it himself. If you did not do that, which you were supposed to and you had to do, you had no choice. Okay? If you did not do that, who did the son belong to? To God, which was a priest. You then belong to the Levites, to the priesthood. And your role and your vocation was to carry out the priestly ministry. Okay? But what would happen is the the the, the Kohanim, which you learned about last week, is which, which is a priest, or the, those from the Levitical clan, this didn't apply to them because they were already in the priesthood. Okay? They were part of the priesthood, so it didn't apply to them. So what would happen is, if you were not, you would take your five shekels and you would redeem your son. You would pay a ransom so that you could get your son back. Have you got it? You've got to get it, otherwise you're not going to understand. Right, Exodus 13, 13 to 16, it says, Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey. In other words, everything. Okay? But if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Seems cruel, but it's so that you understand that everything belongs to God. And it may never have a hold on a grip of your heart. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. In days to come, when your sons ask you, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh uh, stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed every firstborn in Egypt, both ma man and animal. This is why I sacrificed to the Lord the first male, of, male offspring of every womb and redeem each of them my firstborn sons. And it will be like a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead that the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty, mighty hand. First fruits. <laughs> I've taught on that years ago. And that's very important. Giving the first of your salary. If you earn your first salary, that you should give to the priest. If you get an increase, you should give that to the... And why? So that it never grips your heart. What grips your heart? What has a hold of your heart? Because you have not applied God's word to your life. <coughs> so if you do not, if you did not redeem your son, your son belonged to the priesthood, and here to carry out priestly roles, okay? You need to understand that. Right, are you ready for God to blow your minds away? Now, you've got that as a background. Now we're going to read John 12, verse 3 to 6. Then Mary, Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. There's a whole mystery in that. Should I share on that one? Hey? Okay, I might do that then the next time. Because it's too, too much to just get into there. This was a prophetic declaration. It's super cool. But in any case, she goes and she pours this expensive pure nod on him. It was about how much in value? What does the Bible say? A year's wages. Is that not an incredible heart of love? Who, would, who of you would go and give God just like that, a whole year's wages? She was Mary Magdalene. Remember we learned last week that she was a prostitute. She should have been stoned. And what did God, Jesus say? The, the law says you must stone her. So I say stone her. However, the one... Without any sin, you, you be the one to throw the first stone. And what happened? Everyone ran away. Everything with their tails between their legs. Come. And he stands there and he says, 
he says to her, so no one condemns you, therefore I do not condemn you, but, 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 change your way that you live in and go and sin no more. So do not think that you can ride on the grace of God because many of us think we can ride on the grace of God. And he says, ah, ah, ah. I show you grace, I show you mercy, I show you unconditional love. However, I don't want you to live in a manner that is unfitting and unpleasing to me. Now go in peace. How super cool is that? And here she comes because she so loves him. Because she, did, she was not just saved from a physical stoning, from death. She was also saved spiritually. And loved unconditionally. Can you just imagine the love? She had never experienced that love, ever. Okay? Not with any man. This was a different love. This is what you call an agape love. That Jesus. And so she pours this nod on. And then she goes a step further and she wipes it with, she, she wipes the dirtiest part of any human being. And that's her, the, her feet, the, a man's feet. And she wipes her, his, his feet with her hair. Who of you women would do that? Not you with short hairs, you old ladies. I'm talking to, who of you would do that? Because you love him so much. Don't use a cloth, use your hair. Coming before him with absolute love and humility. I think it's super awesome. Do you understand how her heart had been changed by the love of God? Not the condemnation. May he, his, his love for us change our hearts. Then it carries on and here we're going. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Where was his heart? He had allowed money to grab his heart. And he has a reflection in his response to an incredibly beautiful act of love and adoration. And his heart was totally revealed to everyone. He was the, of the disciples, he was the money keeper. Here we have Trevor. Trevor is a godly man and we thank God for him that he's not like Judas Iscariot. Trevor does a splendid job and uh, we have some, someone, Sally in uh, Polokwani, that does the books, finishes them, doesn't charge the church a cent. How awesome is that? Okay, we're small, but that's not the point. The point is that you have faithful, godly people. And I guarantee you, everything you do for God will be rewarded. Okay. But here Judas surrenders himself to, a sinful th to his sinful thoughts and desires. And he eventually ends up loving money above God. He loves money, things, more than he loves the Lord Jesus. He surrenders his life to things. And I'd like to ask you, what about you? Do you live a principle-centered life where you say, these things I will stick to and I will not deviate from them? I believe some of them are like, I need to spend time every day with the Lord. I need to pray every day and place my request before Him. Or don't you need to, you just can do it on your own. What about fellowshipping with believers? What about going to church every Sunday? Giving a minimum of a tithe. What about keeping a Sabbath day holy or should I say keeping one day aside where that belongs to God? Not uh, just another extra day for work. Those are, if you do not, if you ha if God doesn't solidify those principles in your heart, you will live however you choose. And you'll sell your soul for things instead of Him.
Right, John 6 verse 64, it says, Yet there were some, listen, Jesus speaking, Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. Jesus knew who was going to betray him. Have any of you noticed and thought, but Jesus, if you are such an incredible judge of character, how is it that you chose Judas Iscariot to be one of your twelve? Who of you have ever thought that? None of you thought that. Because I think Jesus was an incredible judge of character, don't you think? He was God incarnate, he became just like you and I. But yet he was without sin. So the question is, did he make an error in choosing Judas Iscariot? Certainly not. He never made an error. He was spotless. He was without wrinkle. He was uh, without blemish. He was pure and holy and never sinned and never made an error. So then what is it? There was obviously way more to it than what we see. Matthew 26, 18 to 25. I read a lot of scripture because I want you to see that this is scripturally based. Matthew 26, 18, it reads as follows. He replied, Jesus speaking, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve, with all of his chosen disciples. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Imagine you were one of the twelve. What would you have thought? Carries on, says there, they were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who dips his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it was written about him. In other words, in the Old Testament. And there are many prophetic declarations of how he would, and prophecies of how he would, uh, how he would go. But it says there, but woe to, to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Verse 25, then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. What would you have done if you were him? <coughs> would you have saw, oh, I'm going to do something now to change my ways? What would you have done? What would you have done in that situation? All of us here I sit there and think, Josh, I would have immediately said, that's not going to happen to me, Lord, change my heart. Wouldn't you have done that? You'd have me what about Peter? Jesus says, you're going to betray me three times. What would you have done if he said that? You've been forewarned. I would have immediately gone and locked myself in a closet and said, Lord, please help me <laughs> purify. And not gone anywhere till so it couldn't happen. Wouldn't you have done something like that? Yet Jesus said it, and every time a coconut it happened. A perfect prophet. He declares something, and once he's declared it, it is going to take place. No matter what wills it not to happen, it's going to happen. That's why when he says he's going to come again, to take his bride, his church, without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. He's going to do it. And you can be assured and hold on to that, which is, for me, super cool. Now, the Passover is drawing near, and guess what the priests are doing? They are plotting how they're going to capture Jesus and then kill him. And they have no clue of the incredible importance of what they're actually doing. And what the significance of what was taking place. Matthew 26, 14 to 16. 
Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I, if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him thirty silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So do you see that this was planned? It was premeditated. Yet he was supposed to love Jesus more than things, more than money. But he loved money, actually, more than Jesus. How sad. And sadly, that is the case with many people today. Judas then goes to the priest and agrees to betray Jesus for how many? 30 pieces of silver. Now, 30 pieces of silver was basically, they say, it was a month's wage. There are others that say it was four months' wages. And it was the value of what? What, did you, what could you buy with 30 pieces of silver? Guess. A car. A car. <laughs> Maybe. You could buy a slave with 30 pieces of silver. Now we're going a little bit deeper. And I'm, it's, for me it's irrelevant whether it's that you're a month wage or four months. I'm not going to get into that debate. Choose whichever you like, okay? The bottom line is it was the wage of... It was what you would buy a slave for. That's the important point here. Exodus 21 verse 32, just to clarify this. If a bull goes a male or female slave, the owner must pay 30 shekels of silver to the master of the slave, and the bull must be stoned. In other words, you were reimbursing the loss of that owner. With how much? 30 pieces of silver. The price of a slave. Okay? So, tell me, what are, what are you willing to sell out your relationship with God for? Hmm? Many people say nothing. Are you willing to sell, it, sell your relationship out for money? Positions, good times, movies, Facebook, Instagram, Candy Crush, business, holidays, weekends away. Come on. This is the church. Come on. I'm talking to you. What are you selling out your relationship with God for? Bed? Late sleeping on a Sunday, whatever? Instead of being with God? There are many, there, there are many attractions to sin, I acknowledge. But the consequence, not worth it. Matthew 26, 48 to 49 says, Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Can you just imagine here, Judas had been around Jesus for three years, been equipped and taught and seeing these incredible revelations and prophetic words and healings yet he still he doesn't just betray him he goes and he kisses him shows the most intimate affection to him kisses him on the cheek and in so doing he betrays the one that he's supposed to call Lord isn't that sick how many Christians do that today and what's the key? If we do not make our hearts vulnerable and say, Lord, have your way in my heart. Change me, O Lord. This word will mean nothing to you. Unless you say, Lord, wow, I'm mind this is mind-boggling. And you take on, and in a week you allow it to shift into the innermost part of your being. It means nothing. It's just words spoken. But if it falls on fertile soil... It will produce a harvest. So may you not have a rocky soil. May you say, Lord, here I am. Vulnerable before you. 
allow this to sink deep into my heart and form roots that may bring glory to your name. And may it not be falling on rocky soil this morning. And here he goes and he kisses him and he betrays him for how much? 30 pieces of silver. Now, let's change gears. Are you ready for God to blow your mind? What was the pigeon I've been? It was where the father would pay five shekels of silver to the priest to redeem, to buy back his son. Okay? Here, the priests plotted to, be, to, to, to pay old what Judas 30 pieces of silver. Now, this money that was going to be paid over to Judas came from where? From where? The temple. And that money came from the pigeon of being, being paid to the priests. Hello? And they took that some of that money and they paid it to Judas. And in a sense what they were doing, they were paying... And saying, we are giving you this. And we are buying back. We are, want him back to the priesthood. And without them even knowing, he became the high priest. In the order of Amal Shezedek, forever. They did not even know that they were doing that. And they paid this ransom. It was the first and only time where money was paid from the priesthood. So that they could say, no, you need to, to come. We want you as the priest. However, what, what, what was the lamb? The firstborn lamb had to be sacrificed for the forgiveness of the sins of the people. And Jesus is known as the Lamb of God that was shed before the foundation of the earth. And here he becomes redeemed as the priest, but he also becomes the first born among many. He becomes the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the earth. And hence he had to be sacrificed to restore, to become our ransom. So that he could become our restorer. And this is what took place here, without them even realizing what they were doing. And the incredible significance of what was taking place here. I don't know if you've all got this, some of you, are, are you getting it? So here, the pigeon of bin was there to ransom your son. Then it came the other way, where the priests paid for the one and only time in history. They took and they said, no. We want to buy him back. For the price of a what? Slave. And Judas was willing to sell him for that. How absolutely incredible is that? And here he becomes the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He becomes the firstborn Lamb. It takes away the sins of mankind. We read in 1 Peter 1 verse 18 to 19 it says, For you know that it was with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed. You know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. But with the precious blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish or defect. And here he becomes the ultimate ransom, the ultimate redeemer of mankind. The only redeemer. Do you see the shadow and the type? Do you see how this was a prophetic declaration, the pigeon of bin was a, a, a shadow of what was to come in Christ Jesus. And this, was, this had to happen. 
where the priests go and they buy him back and he becomes the ultimate priest. They had to buy him the Lamb of God that he could become the sacrifice once and for all for the sins of mankind. It is mind-boggling. And we read it and we... I don't think... I don't know, maybe one or two people in the whole kingdom of God knows this. But I'm telling you, I, know, I searched no one. I could not find this. This is for me, it blesses me out of my cotton-picking socks. Have you connected the dots? Do you now understand? 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 to 20 says, Do you not know that your bodies is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have, who you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. And you and I were bought with the precious blood of the Lamb. He gave his life for us. How much more so should we do the same? And when he says, give the first fruits of this or this, and we think, ah. There is nothing. He gave his life for us. May we not ever compromise on the word of God. May we say, Lord, I choose to give you my all. I will withhold nothing from you. I will choose to make my heart vulnerable. So that whatever you're wanting to do will take deep root and not fall on rocky soil. Philippians 2 verse 5 to 11, one of my most special parts of the Bible. We, I'm going to read the whole thing so much. Here it goes. Your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something for us to try and grasp, to comprehend, which I don't think we are, have an ability to do. But made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Actually, there it talks about bond servant. Hello? And you see how it connects the dots here. He, he didn't just come to serve, but here he actually was bought for the price of a bond servant, of a slave. Yet he was God himself. I mean, he was God. Yet they give a measly month's wage or four months wage. But they didn't understand that they were buying him back into the priesthood, that he may become priest on high in the order of Melchizedek, and that he becomes the ultimate lamb that sacrifices for the sin of mankind. Carries on says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Christ, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And did, did he not just deserve that? He could have called down a legion of angels and squashed that whole plan just like that. Yet he chose to humble himself and serve us and say, here I am. Take me. I don't want their blood to be shed. Why? Because our blood will never suffer. Now, the question is, what about you? Where do you stand with God? Jesus becomes our pigeon, our redeemer, our ransom. But has he become your pigeon bin where he becomes, where he buys you back? Have you said, yes, Lord, would you ransom me? I need your blood. I need you to come and cleanse me and purify me. Because if you do not accept him as your pigeon bin, you will pay with your own blood. If you are not redeemed by the price he paid, you will pay with your own blood and you'll go to hell and it will be an ongoing, everyday occurrence and it will never satisfy. And hence, hell will be hell and will never stop. That is why he says, I lay before you life and death. Choose life. And every human being has the same opportunity. May you choose life this day. 
May you say, Lord, I choose you. I acknowledge you and I say, would you be my ransom, my pigeon of being this day and forevermore? I don't want to pay that price. Thank you that you love me so much that you were willing to pay the ultimate price of love and be my ransom and give your life for me.